thank you for joining us here today for the state policy and how to increase work equity through disability inclusion, where we will discuss state level policies examples that are emerging as solutions to address the workforce disparities. This webinar is a result of a collaboration with NBCSL's partner, the State Exchange on Employment and Disability. SEED is a free resource that helps policymakers advance workforce diversity, equity, and inclusion as their goals for, your, for each state. I encourage you to take note of the policies assistance that SEED provides and reach out to the SEED team. I'd like to thank you all for being a part of this presentation. Representative Dontavius Jarrell of Ohio, Representative Camille Lilly of Illinois, Assemblyman Sahil Anderson, Khalil Anderson from New York. Thank you all for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. I would now like to introduce to you today's moderator, Atiba Mendium. Thank you, President Hall, for that introduction. And as you heard, I'm with the State Exchange on Employment and Disability, or SEED. It's an initiative with the United States Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy, also called ODEP. Now, before beginning, I'd like to thank NBCSL, first off, for hosting this webinar and for its partnership in our State Exchange on Employment and Disability initiative. I can't tell you how grateful we are for the continued collaboration and advancing inclusion across the United States. SEED is a unique federal, state, local collaboration that supports state and local governments in adopting and implementing inclusive policies and best practices that lead to increased employment opportunities for people with disabilities and a stronger, more inclusive workforce and economy. And as I said, we're so pleased to call NBCSL a SEED partner. When we talk about people with disabilities, we are referring to individuals who are born with or who acquire a disability. This includes not only the visible disabilities many people think of when we say disability, but also our nation's disabled veterans, the many Americans who have acquired a disability due to long COVID-19, and individuals with mental health conditions or substance use disorder, among others. In fact, one in five working Americans has a disability, and most of us will become disabled at some point in our lives. So the issues we work on through SEED truly affect us all. Unfortunately, we know that people with disabilities face stark employment inequities compared to people without disabilities. In fact, the latest labor force participation rate of disabled people is 39.6% compared to 76.8% for people without disability. In addition, we know there are significant racial disparities in employment with Blacks with disabilities employed at lower rates than whites with disabilities. And based on 2022 data from the current population survey, CPS, the labor force participation rate for Blacks with disabilities is nearly 10% lower than white people with disabilities. Black workers and job seekers with disabilities represent a diverse, talented group that can help fill the gaps and be part of this job solution. So advancing the employment of, of employment of people with disabilities is a way to better and to bolster our economy and build strong workplaces, cultures that embrace DEIA. Not only is building an inclusive workforce the right thing to do morally, but a growing body of evidence demonstrates that diverse, equitable, inclusive, and accessible workplaces yield higher performing organizations. Now, when we're talking about the workplace, a key barrier to disability inclusion is accessibility. And accessibility should not be an afterthought, but rather a priority that is integrated into and across organizations' functions and embedded into workplace culture. So public and private sector workplaces must develop processes to increase accessibility and reduce barriers to employment so that we can build a strong workforce that everyone can participate in. Today, we're going to explore some of these exemplary policies and practices around the employment of people with disabilities and hear from several state policymakers on ways they have successfully broadened their approach to full inclusion in the workplace. So with that, I'm eager to hear from our featured speakers and look forward to a robust discussion. First off, 
I'd like to introduce Representative Dontavius Jarrells. Representative Jarrell serves as my Assistant Minority Leader of the Ohio General Assembly and is currently in his second term serving the residents of Columbus in House District 1. Representative Jarrell has also served as a task force member of SEED's Mental Health Matters National Task Force on Workforce Mental Health Policy. Representative Jarrell, thank you so much for serving as a panelist today. And as a member of the Mental Health Matters National Task Force and a leader in cultivating a workforce reflective of the community you serve, what are some of your perspectives leading this work and what is your personal motivation for working on disability inclusion and mental health workforce policy? Well, first off, Atiba, thank you so much for allowing me to be on today and to uh, President Hall uh, and uh, NBCSL Seed. You know, what a fantastic panel. Uh, that we're going to be diving deep into the realities that so many of our uh, disability community faces as they try to enter the workforce, stay in the workforce, and uh, endure in the workforce. Um, as was stated, Dontavious Gerald represented the great House District 1. Um, and I'll tell you, prior to becoming a legislator, I had opportunity to be the health equity director for the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. It's an agency that works uh, day in and day out to ensure that families are getting what they need to live their best life, uh, making sure that recovery and prevention supports and treatment is there when families need it and we're truly building no wrong door. And so that's the kind of the starting point for my talk today uh, is one, we got to make sure that that wrong door includes ensuring that individuals across the disability perspective have what they need and the tools that they deserve to truly thrive, not just in Ohio, but across the nation. It requires making sure that there is an array of opportunities for individuals to enter uh, the workforce by, uh, by special accommodations. It's making sure that there are agencies, uh, partners that are working day in and day out to provide the, that level of support that they deserve. It's making sure that we are hiring lived experience and people with lived experience in our agency so that when folks come across our desk to say, hey, I'm having this issue. I'm, I can't enter the workforce. I'm, reach, I'm hit, hitting all these di different barriers. There's someone who understands, has a cultural linguistic competence to help them get through to an end that's going to be better for them and their families. And so that's what I did at the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, working incredibly hard to figure out what, what can I do to turn over every stone uh, to make sure that we are supporting these families. And in Ohio, 14.1% of our community is folks who have a disability. And so this is not a small number. This, this is a significant amount of people across the state from every region, for every perspective, every cultural perspective, uh, and they deserve to make sure that they have what they need. And so as state representative, one of the first things that I did, we look at our Ohio Revised Code, which governs our body and gov governs the laws across the state. We had words like the, um, uh, retarded or the R word. Um, we had words like insane. I mean, the words that impacted the developmental disability community, uh, intellectual disability community, um, the physical disability community. And these words were rooted in stigma because as was stated earlier in terms of some of the remarks about um, just how do you, some of the barriers to access, a lot of those barriers is people's perceptions of what it means to have a disability. And so one of the first bills, is, one of my first bipartisan bills that I passed in a law was changing 32 terminologies in our Ohio Revised Code that uplifted the families of those with disabilities and the individuals themselves. And we just didn't do this by happenstance. We had over 60 different community partners and coalitions come together to help us fine tune the Ohio Revised Code so that it truly resembles the people in which make up Ohio, which include though that 14.1%. And so that's the framework and the starting point that we can then build upon, right? And so the next level of engagement that I've started working on is working on how do we ensure that we're creating a space so as these individuals, as they enter the workforce, they don't fall off a cliff or what, what we call here a benefit cliff. And so working with, uh, again, another bipartisan bill, some of my Republican colleagues, we were able to begin to look at our, uh, I would call it the uh, benefit resources that are available to all Ohioans, including our disability individuals, um, and look at like SNAP, um, uh, rental assistance, 
childcare, right? Because we know that, again, folks with disabilities come from all walks of life. And what are we doing to ensure that as these individuals enter the workforce, they're not inadvertently cut off from those benefits simply because they make a dollar or 40 cents over the, the particular threshold of that eligibility requirement. And so what we did was create a number of different pilots to begin to look at uh, the benefit cliff and how do we create a bridge to opportunity. And so that's kind of how we began to look at, you know, creating that baseline so that as individuals enter the workforce, they're not necessarily put in it into a chaotic environment simply because of the fact that they're they're making a little bit more, more money than that, their, their eligibility. But then let's go back, let's back up a little bit. Um, we also got to create cultural brokers. I mean, what I mean by that is individuals who, again, with that lived experience, can help navigate those individuals through the employment in, uh, environment so that, one, we're addressing the st stigma when it presents itself. Two, we're actually providing additional supports to these individuals when and if they need it. And then three, there's that warm handoff in terms of individuals who can speak their language and really begin to share with them, here's how you navigate the system or navigate this field or navigate this occupation. Uh, and so, so much of that work is, is happening, not just in law, but in policies and regulations that we are creating within our departments, whether it is our Department of Development and Disabilities, whether it is Ohio Moss or ODRC, which is our Hard Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, we're looking at policies that dictate how individuals navigate programs and ensure that those rules and regulations truly uplift all of us across the state of Ohio. And so I'll stop there and we'll answer any questions, but um, I'm excited to be on the panel and happy to continue to do the work to truly build an Ohio that we all deserve. Thank you, Representative Jarrells, and thank you for your leadership um, in, this, in this area and, your, and for bringing our attention to these important issues. With that, I'd like to introduce our second presenter, Representative Camille Lilly. Representative Lilly serves Chicago's Greater West Side in the 78th Illinois House District and has spent her career advocating for and working toward economic opportunity, community development, health and wellness, and educational advancement for district residents. Thank you, Representative Lilly, for joining us today. And we'd like to hear from you today about your personal motivation for working on disability inclusion and why it is a priority for you as the chair of the Illinois House Appropriations Health and Human Services Committee, including your efforts to increase workforce equity with the recently enacted College and Career Pathway legislation, HB3296. Wow. Well, good afternoon, um, everyone. And I too want to say thank you, Ativa, for moderating us and pulling us together to talk about this important subject. And thank you for the leadership of President Hall, Laura Hall, for always talking about the things that's really making a difference in the lives of people. And MBESL with friends, Steve, let's keep moving in this direction. We have a lot to do on behalf of. Uh, what makes America great, right? Um, two, um, my motivation for this space, um, I am the chair of the Health and uh, Human Services here in the state of Illinois, and I get to have the opportunity to look at all the needs that make people um, ready for work, right? Uh, from health um, to also social needs, those human services, those wraparound services. And what we're finding out is people are not ready, right? Um, and we have not put in our mainstream, the support systems and even the training or the access or the opportunity for them to be ready. So I am really here to say quality life stems from preparation. And if we do not put um, these types of preparation in mainstream and mainstream in my opinion is school, <laughs> And we, if we do not put those in those um, elements that everyone has access to, uh, we are missing the boat. And real quickly, um, when I introduced HB 3296, it was actually about um, individuals, meaning young people, not understanding work ethics. They just was coming to work um, because they needed a paycheck, as we all do. <laughs> So what I said, let's back up a little bit and create um, opportunities in the school settings, uh, in the school districts that create these um, career paths and the career 
and college opportunities. So as I was doing that work, um, and HB 3296 uh, just really changes how the school district um, can participate. And with this, um, they basically allow the schools um, starting in 2025, the ability to implement a career path endorsement program. But it's for all individuals. When you look at the development disabled communities, we have actually um, not done enough to um, make them part of our mainstream. And this particular uh, piece of legislation includes all of our students that are in our school system. The school has the ability to work with their board of education and create the timelines for the implementation of this type of career path. And basically it gives the young people the opportunity in advance to explore their career aspirations. It gives the school the resources to put those aspirations or those vocational or those career paths within their educational system so they can have that opportunity. Again, this is for all individuals. One of the things that uh, when you're looking at the disabled community and as the chair of the pro Human service, I get to talk to everybody. We here in Illinois developed um, a what they call um, guide study for the development disabled community and created um, a path to support their needs. And it really, uh, I get to fund it every year. Um, they want their money now, as most people do, um, but it's a phase in uh, approach to ensure our development disabled community has access to not only their basic needs, but their career opportunities that allow them to feel uh, valued citizens here in Illinois. And it really is uh, exciting to see the implementation of that particular study. With that, um, we want to make sure that they're paid um, what we call a livable wage. And we are now introduce, introducing legislation that allows us to create a task force to make sure we're figuring out how to pay the development disabled a livable wage and they can be valuable uh, employees to our mainstream business uh, community. And I'm excited to um, uh, participate in this task force that allows all of us to um, bring value. The last thing, um, I'm also working on um, what I title, and many of the disabled fit in this category, uh, the sub-minimum wage um, issue that's created um, in our society. I don't even know why we have it, but we do. Um, and basically, um, individuals are working in maybe the restaurant in industry, the hair industry, and, all, and many places where many disabled get those jobs, right? Um, they are subbing them wage. They're not making, um, it's here in Illinois, they're making $7.80 an hour, where our minimum wage is $15 an hour. Nationally, that minimum wage is $2.41. So when you're looking at all population, particularly development, they are falling into this gap and their quality of life is affected. So we want to do um, all we can to change all these policies. So we're getting rid of, we're phasing out some minimum wage, we're creating a task force that allow us to make sure every employer is comfortable with all persons disabled and those who are challenged, right? And and we are also introducing it into our school system where we are now making it mainstream. So we got a lot of work to do we, and we have to monitor it and keep up with it. But uh, I just like to bring all of this to you from Illinois <laughs> that allows um, us to be a little bit ahead um, and cutting edge and making sure that all Illinoisans uh, have quality and they have value to our society. And I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Little, for <laughs> elevating these issues and sharing your experiences from Illinois. Assemblymember Khalil Anderson is our final panelist today. He represents Assembly District 31 in Queens and is the youngest Black Assembly member in New York State history. His priorities include housing and health care justice, criminal justice reform, educational equity, transportation equity, and environmental justice. Thank you so much for joining us, Assembly Member. As a member Thank of the you. New York, Thank you. as a member of the New York Assembly Committee on People with Disabilities, you've been in a unique position to advance workforce equity and inclusion. 
including your recent bill, A760, providing equality of rights and protection against discrimination. Would you mind sharing your perspectives on this work and why it is a priority for you? Yeah, thank you so much, um, um, Brother Madam, and to all of my colleagues across the nation. Thank you so much for being here and, and having this conversation about disability justice. Um, I'll start with my per personal motivation. Um, growing up in the public school system, single parent household um, in, in central Brooklyn, and then moving to Rockaway uh, when I was just in fourth grade, you know, the system that we lived under, whether it was the education system or even the workplace system, really had a, a negative tenor, negative tone uh, towards individuals who needed additional support. My personal motivation uh, for working on issues pertaining with disability inclusion was that I was diagnosed with a uh, invisible disability uh, when I was set when I was seven. Uh, and that disability is emotional disturbance and ADHD. And those were the labels that I lived with throughout my academic career uh, in the public school system. As we say in New York, um, from, from K to 16, because that includes the four grades or four years uh, in college. And so for me, I was a student at PSMS 256, which was a school specifically for students who, who have disabilities. Uh, whether it's learning disabilities, whether it's emotional or behavioral disabilities, uh, which we call the invisible disabilities, um, you know, there's a clear pipeline uh, and connection that turn those disabilities uh, into criminalization and creates that pipeline uh, to criminalize rather than provide services and resources for those individuals. So I took my disability I took the things that I struggled with, with with my emotional disability and transitioned and channeled that into activism. And that's why, you know, I, you know, wrote two bills. Uh, one was A10483 last cycle. And then this cycle we have uh, A0076. Now, those two bills is a bill that would really, like, sink some teeth into some of the agencies that are responsible for helping connect people with developmental disabilities um, to, to resources, to services, um, and to make sure that the agencies that serve those individuals are being properly staffed with individuals who have disabilities and so on. And so that bill made it through, I believe is unanimous in both houses, uh, both the Senate and the Assembly. I've got to go back and check the voting record. Um, but essentially what the bill would do, it, again, it requires an Office of People with Disabilities um, to produce and publish a report that looks at staffing issues and other issues, um, you know, that cause displacement for individuals who have developmental disabilities from different state institutions uh, and the ones that also are under the jurisdiction of stated agency. And so this was a study bill um, to help us correct the wrongs that we're seeing within the system as it relates to employing individuals who have developmental disabilities, particularly within the agencies that are, you know, the agencies named, Office of People with Disabilities, uh, and any other jurisdictional levels that that agency has. And so I believe it passed both houses unanimously, bipartisan, good bill, study. Uh, and unfortunately, I got a call Thanksgiving Eve from the governor's team saying that they're vetoing it. Uh, and that was a frustrating thing to me because here, a study bill, um, which the agency sh should be doing this stuff on their own, um, is being vetoed. So it just begs the concern of like, what are they not looking to release as it relates to information, you know, on the subject map. Um, but we've been working with the agency to try to get that data else otherwise outside of the bill. Uh, and that's important. When I think about um, 0076, that's a bill um, that really, really works to make sure that there's equal protection um, for these individuals on the state level. Uh, and that's really important because there's a thing called disability and indivisible, invisible disability discrimination. You have individuals that have physical and visible disabilities. They may walk with a cane. They may be in a wheelchair. Those are disabilities that you can see. Invisible disabilities are like the ones that I have. ADHD, emotional disturbance, um, behavioral issues, maybe bipolar, 
Um, these are disabilities, just to name a few, um, that are often invisible. And they cause the issue of discrimination. There's an issue of discrimination. So 0076 is a bill that would really make sure that we have equal protections for those folks, regardless of whatever type of disability um, those individuals may have. Um, and that includes protecting them from any discriminations, such as civil rights, um, uh, public or private housing accommodations, corporations, and institutions, uh, free sex, you know, including pregnancy, which is also considered a physical disability, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, et cetera. This bill really was comprehensive um, in its approach to looking at ways that we could protect this class of individuals. And again, that motivation comes from being one of us, being one of them, being uh, an individual that lives with an, individual, uh, an invisible disability, and we're trying to work through that. And I've never let my disability hinder our ability to move our communities forward. In fact, last year, in addition to these two bills, we were working on some legislation that would change the label of individuals who are deemed emotionally disturbed and move that over to a less negative connotation, connotation in wording and phrasing. Um, and, and a lot of parents wanted this, um, which would be to uh, change that to emotional dysregulation uh, rather than uh, a disturbance. When you think of somebody that's disturbed, it's a negative conversation. When you think about uh, dysregulation, it's a process and individuals who's working to regulate those things. Uh, and, and they're getting help, resources, and services to regulate those, those build issues. So in a nutshell, um, those are the two bills um, and one concept bill that we were working on. And ultimately, um, the city council here in New York uh, and other entities have been making moves um, to pass similar legislation like 0076. For example, New York State uh, passed a bill, New York City, excuse me, passed a bill that bans discrimination based on a person's weight, uh, weight and height. You, you'd be surprised how weight and height can impact employment opportunities. Weight and height can pick, uh, impact access to public accommodation. So that's been banned in the city. What our bill looks to do is create uh, a like ban on the state level for all 62 counties in New York State. Thank you, Assemblymember Anderson, for sharing those perspectives on achieving workforce equity in District 31 in Queens and throughout the state of New York. Um, I'd like to move now to a discussion with all three of our esteemed participants, and we have some questions lined up. So if you don't mind, let's begin. Um, I'm going to start with Representative Durrells, and the, I'll ask the question. If you need me to repeat it, I'm happy to do it. But um, if, if all of our panelists could, could also um, answer this. Tell me a bit more broadly about workforce equity and inclusion priorities in your state. And then what are the biggest challenges to advancing workforce equity, particularly for those who belong to marginalized communities, such as people with disabilities who have experienced more profound hardship, including employment discrimination during and following the pandemic? Ooh, that's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> um, so, so first and foremost, I, I think, one of the biggest issues related to workforce um, inequity is pay. Um, and I think Representative Lilly and uh, uh, Assemblymember Anderson talked a little bit about this. Uh, you know, one of my first House bills is House Bill 69, which we moved to raise the minimum wage to at least to $15. Obviously, the reality is it needs to be a living wage, which is much higher. But it was a starting point because currently in Ohio, our minimum wage is $10.10. And so it's uh, not enough for anyone to uh, pay their bills, let alone go on a vacation or go to a nice uh, dinner on at all, right? And I remember my mom having to work multiple jobs just to make ends meet. And so it's not just a policy of aspiration, it's a lived experience that I bring with me into, uh, into the legislature. And so that's the first thing. The second thing we have to really talk about is pay inequity across gender perspectives. Um, you know, one of the things that we're experiencing here in Ohio, and I have a colleague that's pushing this, and I'm co-sponsored a bill, uh, was pay equity uh, or parity and, and, and pay, and really being thoughtful about how do we ensure that individuals across all perspectives um, and gender pers uh, perspectives get uh, equal pay and work. Um, you know, as someone, again, who lived in an environment where 
you know, all of these inequities impacted the reality and the conditions in our communities. Uh, not having pay or having a high enough pay impacts every other perspe perspective and connection in life. Um, and so let's move down deeper down the stream, right? Because we're kind of working upstream. So down the stream, now we get into, uh, you know, uh, you know, just unfortunate discrimination when it comes to individuals with development disabilities. And so what are we doing uh, to make sure that we are um, trying to really build equity within our system? One, as I mentioned earlier, is, is illuminating the problem. Oftentimes, these are silent issues that impact people. And because of the uh, nature of a bureaucracy, sometimes their voices don't reach the policymakers. And so one of the things I, I want to do is in, it was, was what I did was I, I created a table, if you will, of individuals with those, those lived experiences who came to the table, not just with me, but with other legislators to say, here's what we are, here's what is impacting me as a system. And what are you going to do as our legislators to address these issues? And so, again, that's how uh, my House Bill, House Bill 110 from last GA was born, right? It was born out of the fact that, you know, hey, the stigma is unbearable, is preventing us from getting employed, is preventing us from being seen as human beings. We're, be seen, we're seen as lesser than. And so we wanted to create a space for which we actually sat down and said, okay, what, what is the every term that impacts you and your family. And from that, we were able to, to move on and get that bill signed to law by the governor because of the work, not just for me as a legislator, but from the work happening on the ground with these individuals. And so, so much of the, uh, I think the, the basis of what we're experiencing, part of it is because of the fact that we have people who feel voiceless and we got to give voice to their concerns. And then two, actually build real and tangible policies and laws that's going to do, impact them directly, which leads me to my last point related to, and, and, and Assembly Member Anderson talked a lot about this from his bill. In Ohio, we are really dedicated and keenly focused on making sure that we're looking at our policies that we don't have to put in law. These are just administrative rules. And we're making sure that in our administrative rules, people from developmental disabilities and across the spectrum are seen, are heard, and are affirmed, right? It's making sure that we're hiring individuals with that lived experience so that they can speak up at the policy tables. It's making sure that we are doing everything we can to build programming to, when we go out in the community, these individuals are falling through the crack because we curate, curated programs that directly meet them where they are. It's looking at, um, you know, how our, what is our leadership makeup? And are we ensuring that individuals who are blind, who are deaf, are at the table ensuring that their experience is being is a part of the formulation of these programs. You know, and that's the work that I did as a health equity director prior to being elected. It was looking at and having the hard conversations, y'all. I think some of these conversations are really hard because you got to rock the table a little bit to say, you know, you know, some of the things that we're putting in policy is racist or is prejudiced or is harmful to these people. And if you don't have people who are championing those these issues in a real and intentional way, um, you know, these individuals are going to continue to suffer. And so having folks at the table with that lived experience is probably one of the most powerful ways that we begin to eradicate the visceral stigmas and discriminations that we're seeing in policy and rule. Representative Lilly, did you want to add in? I, I, I do, I do. I, I will echo um, everything shared by representative by the representative, I just would like to say succinctly as much as I can is that that educational piece installing uh, within our educational system um, exposure and the improving the student's experience around work is really key. We have to embed that into our uh, academics, starting with K or uh, preschool, if you will. Um, when you improve that experience, they are ready. It enhances their career readiness. It ensures that the school systems are supportive of making and setting career tracks for every student. It prepares them for their college vision and opportunity um, with a career path. Um, and it endorses the work that we've been doing in our academics since kindergarten. We are now preparing them. So that's one. Two, today, 
anybody going to work is challenged. There are so many wraparound services that an individual needs. As mentioned earlier, many of us are struggling with some basic life issues from addiction to mental health, to access to quality employment. So you, you, know, you really have a challenge with just getting to work. We, the state, should look at how we are supporting the wraparound services and needed for all of the workers, particularly the disabled. When you look at that community, or you look at what their needs are, it's transportation, it's um, um, a support system, um, it's better work, working tools and environment. That's going to take resources to make those things um, better. So it is important that we look at the health and wellness um, of all of the employees um, that, that are choosing to work. And when you do that, um, you, get the best, you get the best candidate. But if you don't do that, you will not. Um, you will have a worker, uh, a disabled worker, who's willing to work, not having all that they need to do their best. And then lastly, as mentioned, uh, one fair wage. Just because I'm disabled doesn't mean I need to make, make less. It is important that we have one fair wage that allow everyone to contribute and feel valued in our country and in their state and in their homes and in their community. And today, sisters and brothers, that's not how people feel. So when we go forth with these types of legislation, we have to keep those basic uh, essentials in mind. So I'll stop there. Oh, and let me just say, the challenge is putting the budget in place that is physically, physically sound and socially responsible. You can't do one without the other. And, um, and that can be challenging. But as again, the chair of Approach Health and Human Services, I'm up for the challenge. Assembly member, would you mind um, sharing your thoughts on this? Yes, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to my colleagues, too. It's just like the fire and the passion is clear in this space. And that is a part of how we're going to move our agenda and these things forward. Now, now I want to add something to the conversation by saying that we have to change the dynamic of how we employ the individual with a disability. The dynamic as it presently stands here in the state of New York is that individuals who have learning disabilities, developmental disabilities, or even physical disabilities, uh, everything from autism to uh, individuals who are wheelchair bound, et cetera, are often relegated to an economy um, that deals with menial labor, uh, jobs that are boring, repetitive, unpleasant, uh, otherwise unimportant, uh, and you know they have tasks that are repetitive. And so that, that process, and it happens in our school system here in New York through Access uh, VR, which is a program that helps place uh, and support individuals who have uh, a variety of disabilities as it relates to the workforce and that process, co-op tech and training. But it, it's a pipeline, among other things, that re, re, uh, relegates them to the menial label workforce and then dismisses them as this is as much as you can do. This is as far as you can go. Uh, and it, it uh, isolates them in that regard. And oftentimes those jobs are not well thought of, they're low paying, uh, and they don't allow the individual to have their skill sets and things of that nature challenged. How we change that dynamic now, after describing it, how we change it is look at ways of plugging individuals with disabilities into emerging fields. Tech. There are things that folks who have disabilities can be doing in the tech field to help advance that field. There are things that individuals can do even in cannabis, which is an emerging field here in the state of New York. So I'm talking about how do we marry emerging fields, emerging areas, of employment, of labor, to making sure that there's a pipeline to providing opportunities for individuals who live with disabilities. That is the way that we can begin, those conversations are the way we can begin moving away um, from what is honestly a uh, 20th century practice and concept and idea that, all right, 
you're somebody that has a disability, you can go and work um, in a field somewhere. You can go work in McDonald's somewhere. You could go work in a menial labor um, job or opportunity. And we don't have to pay much attention to you. We don't have to consider your disability. We don't have to worry about upgrading our company, our agency's ADA accessibility or accommodations um, because you're only going to be relegated to this career. Uh, and those are the things that we have to destigmatize. It begins with the words that we use, the phrasing that we use, um, the concepts that we use, and, and it begins also with the pipelines that we use that channel individuals there. No longer should we be um, relegating individuals to menial labor. And I practice what I preach. When I was a student at, um, I was a student in high school, uh, I had a program where we would work to connect individuals. I had been a part of a program where we worked to connect individuals with developmental disabilities uh, and also with uh, physical disabilities that like cerebral palsy. We were able to connect them um, to employment opportunities in the tech field, whether it was being customer service in technology, uh, whether it was uh, rendering services around uh, technology repair, uh, whether it was rendering services around techno technological advisement for individuals that are deemed higher functioning with their auditory skills uh, and, and, and hand skills and, and hand-eye coordination skills, right? Like we want to meet people where we are and we want to be able to connect them to their highest, their mid to highest point and not their lowest um, uh, or mid to lowest point. We want to be able to start folks at a better, better tier. Thank you for that, um, Assembly Member. This next question, I want to start with you, Representative Lilly. And I'm going to give a little bit of background. While the economy has been improving and unemployment has gone down, women have recovered more slowly than men. And Black women's employment has recovered the least. In January 2022, the Black women's unemployment rate was almost twice that of white women's, 5.8% compared to 31 the disparity was even more pronounced for women of color with disabilities. Based on 2022 data from the current population survey, CPS, the labor force participation rate for black persons with disabilities is nearly 10% points lower than white people with disabilities. We know that black workers and job seekers, including those with disabilities, represent a diverse, talented group that can help fill gaps and be part of the job solution. Advancing the employment of people with disabilities, including those with intersecting identities, is a way to bolster our economies and build strong workplace cultures that, in place, that embrace DEIA. Can you share something about any of the DEIA policies or best practices in your state that you've seen have made a positive impact in your workforce? Uh, thank you. Thank you. And um, minorities is the, is the the question we have here. And not only women, but uh, black individuals, brown individuals um, has been, the fact that we have that terminology is the problem. And the reason why we now today need, are creating these offices or these departments titled diver, um, diversity, um, equity and inclusion is because of the terminology of minority. What we need to do is be very, very intentional. And the policies that we have developed here in Illinois um, with the leadership of the Black Caucus are intentional. We have to create the opportunities for those who are minorities. Um, and we have to create an environment where they can excel and be successful. And the policies um, that we have creating this office of diversity, equity, and inclusion is an oversight type of body that works with employers, that work with departments, that work with um, employers, that keeps them focused and keeps them on point to make sure that women have opportunity, have um, equity and fair wages, it creates um, a, a, a plan that allows the minority, black, brown, 
to even be considered for positions that they're not traditionally considered for. It allows the um, individuals, let's say women, to be at the in the boardroom at those tables that um, where the decisions are being made that it helps a work environment uh, or business or an industry better, work better with all of those voices at the same table or at, at the table actually. Um, the policies that we put in place is to, uh, it's intentional. We require you to have diversity at that board room. We require you to have, um, um, particularly in the reentry community, the reentry population, we particularly have removed um, what we have, check the box. We remove those from the application so that they will be able to apply and have those opportunities. And thirdly, uh, we are making sure that the pay, the pay is equitable. It, it, it's unfortunate that women make less than men. It's unfortunate that black women make less than white women. It's unfortunate that black people um, are unemployed, you know, in these settings. So when you have an intentional policy and an office that oversees it, um, that has a, a mere individual who are who's feeling a certain kind of way um, in their communities or in their society or in their state, they know where to go to really ask the questions and get things um, turned around. Prior to these offices, and they're happening in every, they happen in healthcare, they're happening in utilities, they're happening at the state. Now people have a place to go and say, I'm being discriminated. I think I'm being discriminated against. Now, when you have that kind of um, tangible place, you can then uh, make turn things around. And the, disab the disability community um, um, has been dealing with this a long time, if you will. And what we want to do in our, with the task force that I mentioned, we are creating this task force to work out and think through all of those things. So those are two policies that, um, that we're very uh, intentional about. So it takes an intentionality to get to these issues that are very real. Um, and I'm, I'm excited that it's not just in Illinois, it's, it's, a, it's, it's spreading throughout the country to bring uh, diversity, equity, inclusion to all persons. Um, and it's, it's, it's well overdue, it's well overdue. Thank you, Assemblymember Anderson, would you like to share some thoughts on that? I'm gonna come back. Okay, Representative Jarrells. You know, um, there's a lot that I could, I can, we can unpack here on this, on this question, and uh, shout out to Representative Lilly for giving a very comprehensive thought process of, of how uh, they're working at this. I think I'm gonna, so I, I'm in a minority. Uh, I don't have the, uh, we don't have the gavel here in the, in the legislature in Ohio, at least not yet. Um, and so there's a couple of ideas that are very progressive that maybe I'll share with you all and just spread the word and maybe somebody else could pick it up. Uh, the first thing that that I will, that's very aspirational for us is, is a, uh, a provision called equity in all policy. And essentially it was a body um, that is made up of a number of different individuals uh, with various backgrounds and cultural linguistic competence. And every law that we would pass in this body, in this state, would have to run through this committee. And, and essentially the, uh, the goal would be is to research and look at look into whether or not there are inherent gaps, uh, their inherent uh, uh, consequences in these in these laws that could harm people across different cultural perspectives. And I, I, my uh, colleague, whose person shoulders I stand on, Senator Sharlita Tavares, you know, tried to run this bill multiple times through multiple GAs, and unfortunately, it never reached the finish line. And so, when we're talking about gaps in policy, oftentimes there are a lot, a lot of them are unseen. They're un some of it's intentional, and a lot of it's unintentional, right? And so, having this body to kind of unpack the um, consequences of these provisions on the day-to-day -day experiences of people 
is uh, was something that was, again, progressive wishful thinking as we were building uh, laws for all of Ohio. Um, you know, you, you said something earlier, Atiba, in your question about Black women, um, you know, and, and, and for me, it kind of recalled some thoughts I had when I initially started working on our benefit clip bill. It's hard for a Black woman who's raising multiple kids uh, to go to work or take that job uh, promotion if it means that she's going to lose $700 worth of rental assistance. It's hard for uh, a, a Black woman to, you know, take that extra shift if that means she's going to lose $300 in Medicaid benefit or $300 in SNAP benefit, you know. And so at post-COVID, we've seen more jobs available having to pay more because of the sp supply, right? Uh, and, and Or at least the, the demand was high and the supply was low. And so individuals are incentivizing uh, you know, paying more money than what we've seen before. And that's, and our, and our policies and rules have not caught up to COVID, right? And so these individuals, particularly our Black women, are caught in this, you know, this unfortunate reality where they are, you know, going to work, want to go to work more, or want to, you know, do what's best for their family. But what's behind them, what's lurking behind them, is rules that are archaic and unfortunately are punitive in the pursuit of individuals actually being their best self and going to work for their families. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, addressing the benefit clip issue is going to be probably one of my lifetime legacies in terms of, and at least in Ohio, to make sure that Black women or Black people, individuals across the cultural perspectives, when they want to work, they're not they're not impacted negatively if if we're giving them a helping hand along the way, right? If we're providing a little bit of assistance for them for rent, if we're providing a little bit of assistance for them for food or for groceries or um, or for um, emergency assistance, right? And um, and so that's kind of how we need to we need to look at this as a system, right? It's not the individual's fault that people are paying being paid more money, right? Uh, but it is the system's fault if we are penalizing those individuals for being paid more money, right? And so that's mm -hmm. what I believe is 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 kind of at the point, like that's my conflict here in, in this state of Ohio. It's like, and it's not just the state, right? We don't do we don't deal with Medicaid. Medicaid's a federal law, right? The eligibility requirements are federally in statute. And so as much as it is about advocating at the state level for, to change to change some of these rules. We also got to work upward, upstream to our congressional leaders to say, this is what we also need to do to match the times that we're in post-COVID. Thank you very much for that. Assemblymember Anderson, um, the, the last question, um, and, and, and because we're running, unfortunately, out of time, because this is like, it's such a dynamic conversation. Um, what would you, what, what actions would you, or steps would you encourage state policymakers to take who are looking to factor inclusion into their workforce initiative? Yeah, thank you so much. So first things first is we need data. Um, if there are folks doing this already, we need to know what they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, so we definitely, and that's why my bill was so important because it's just the process of beginning data collection because data then informs policy. So we need to know again, which which industries including our own, because when we think about um, different industries, it's like, for example, the assembly, we offer a messenger services program where individuals who, ha uh, who have disabilities can serve as messengers, uh, meaning they bring messages, packages, materials from one part of the capital to the next, all right? Um, in, that, in that dynamic or in that setup, there's disparities on its face, right? For, first, how did those folks get there? How were they referred there? And second, what are we doing to make sure that that workforce is diverse? Because we've heard the, the old adage um, that when white folks catch a cold, black folks get pneumonia. And that is what's happening in our workforce. Um, white folks who are living with disabilities are you know, less employed, but we are even lesser employed. Uh, with individuals with disabilities. And so because there is cold and sickness to begin with, and that cold and that sickness is we don't have pipelines. 
we don't have programs, we're not thinking innovatively for this population, then that means we're always going to get the worst of that worse already. And so my advisement on those things would be, again, the data collection piece um, would be the uh, analysis of, of, of the pipelines and how individuals land there. And also an intentional uh, forcing of the hand, for lack of a better term, in pushing the private sector and the public sector to simply do better. What are you doing to include this population in the workforce? How are you providing accommodation? This is how you'll ensure that both public and private sector are not evading the 30 plus, 40 plus year old ADA law that passed on the federal level, which requires folk to upgrade their facilities, which requires folks to have accommodations and the bills that we're pushing on the state level, which would require um, no disabilities or we'll, excuse me, we'll push back against um, uh, 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 disparities and discrimination is the word I was meaning to say against individuals that had those disabilities. So I think it's a three prong approach how, how I just laid out, laid it out. Representative Lilly, um, in, in, because in the nature of time, um, I'll give you one minute if you wanted to take one to answer that question. Um, it's just really important that we focus on diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, it is important that we don't label ourselves as groups of people, label ourselves as value to any any aspect of our society. And once we do that, and we need to start at the state level because they, you're right, we do need data. But when you look at the state data, what they got work to do, right? In equity, uh, diversity, and inclusion. Um, it is important that we, we hold the state um, feet to the fire to do better in this area. And then it sets the tone of all the other sectors and all the other industry to do just the, th the same, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that would bring forth the opportunities for the disabled, for the black, the brown um, communities to, to get a leg up. And um, education uh, is where it starts. And we need to begin there. Thank you, Representative Jarrells. You know, uh, I only got one minute, right? Only yes, got sir. Seconds, so I'm gonna start, <laughs> start doing a poem. Um, so for me, I, what I will tell you is in Ohio, um, people are facing a lot of challenges and our unemployment rate for right currently or is a roughly 8.9% for people with, with, with disabilities, across all uh, disabilities. And if we're speaking strictly on disabilities, um, what we need to do, I think, is see people's humanity. I think so much of this work is um, you, we just see the disability, or it, in some cases, it is unseen as as similar member uh, Anderson has talked about, and we react to the seen and unseen, but we don't react with compassion. And our policies, unfortunately, don't have compassion built into them. And thus it creates a, a, a discriminatory impact on the people who may need us the most. And so, uh, so, 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 so much of this is really seeing the humanity in each other and using that as the catalyst to build policies that actually reach people where they are. Um, I think if we can't get, if we can't do that, that's kind of the foundation. Right? If you can't do that, all this other stuff we're talking about, it won't ever make it. Right. And so, um, you know, that, that's kind of what I'll say is, is, is a lot of work, but I, what I will tell you is that there are a lot of people who have, um, you know, this has been their life's work to uplift individuals across all cultural perspectives, but particularly our disability community. And we got to listen to them and we got to lean in on them and then build policies that actually support them back. That's it. I want to thank all of you. Representative Lilly, Representative Jarrells, Assemblymember Anderson, thank you so much for sharing your perspectives and your solutions for expanding disability employment in your states. Before we close, I'd like to offer SEED as a partner to you and your policy work around workforce inclusion. So if you haven't already connected with our SEED team, please do so. The team offers a wide range of policy assistance, everything from providing background information on mental health and disability employment, related policies and demonstrating how inclusion intersects with our, with 
your policy agenda to helping you shape your own effective, inclusive workforce policies. So please keep Seed in mind as a resource. You can reach out to me directly through NBCSL or check out Seed online by visiting dol.gov front slash ODEP, O-D-E-P, and clicking on state policy. And with that, thank you all to our participants again. I'm going to turn things over to President Hall to close us out. Thank you, Atiba. Thank you to each one of you for your participation and the energy and enthusiasm that you brought to the panel. I would say that the, the, the takeaways are that you say it's very important for us to focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, all of those. Everyone has value. That is so important as we continue this work and that we should see the humanity in each individual as we are developing and are creating these laws and policies without passion is discriminatory. I think if we take in all of those comments that you have summed it very well, I am honored that you chose to spend this time with us. And as Atiba has just mentioned, we invite you, those of you that are participating, that are listening, that uh, be engaged and get involved with SEED. Thank you, Atiba, for the work that you've done in moderating this uh, panel. Thank you.